I went to Iran, and I was so excited to go to Iran, and uh, I made a TV show for public television. And I just really wanted to humanize 70, 70 million Iranians when I figured we were going to war. People asked me, why are you going to Iran? And I thought about it, because it's a strange thing to want to do, and I thought, you know, I'm going there because it's just good style to know people before you bomb them. <laughs> you know, societies are inclined to dehumanize their enemies, aren't they? So when you kill them, nobody even cares. Do you remember the, a, long, a, a while ago there was a wedding party in the desert outside of Pakistan or something and there was a tall guy and we thought he might have been Osama bin Laden. So the drone just killed everybody in the wedding party. The bride, the groom, grandma and grandpa, all the kids, all the friends and the tall guy. And then later on they find out it wasn't Osama bin Laden. Well, that that's too bad, he shouldn't be so tall. Uh, you know, we didn't even give it a second thought. And then you remember the cute blonde girl who was uh, kidnapped in Aruba? What's her name? See, everybody knows her name. She's a household word. I'm not against her. I'm just wondering, why does our compassion stop there with somebody who looks like us and who's as rich as us? She's not more precious than the unnamed girl that got killed in the desert because she went to that wedding and the guy was tall. She's not more precious. And I refuse to let anybody tell me that the girl in Aruba is more precious than that. That's just part of honesty with this planet, I think. Now, I went to Iran, and I was afraid to go to Iran. I almost left our big camera in Athens because I thought they'd be throwing stones at us when they saw an American crew on the streets of Tehran. Thank goodness I, for some reason, had the nerve to bring our big, expensive, fancy camera because we've never been received so warmly on the streets of anywhere that we filmed us when we were in Iran doing our work. It was an amazing experience, and anybody here could have that experience if they wanted to. Anybody could go to Iran and learn about that society. It was completely new for me. It's very difficult. I mean, you're in a booming city of 12 million people with 10-story tall posters that say, down with the USA. That is painful to see. It makes you angry. You wonder, what's going on here? A flag made out of dropping bombs and skulls. OK, now how old is that? Who put it up there? Why is it there? It's a complicated issue. Do they really think that, death to America? I was in a traffic jam down here under that flag and it was just silent we we're just sitting in the car suddenly my driver just bursts out he says death to traffic <laughs> death to traffic <laughs> I thought it was death to America what about that big sign he said well right now it's death to traffic <laughs> and I asked him well why do you say that and he said well in Iran when something's frustrating to us and it's out of our control we say death to that and I thought about it, and I thought about all my friends here in America that freak out every time Ahmadinejad says death to America. You know, that's the whole rallying cry. They say death to America, we'll kill them. And I wondered, why do they say that? Well, first of all, he speaks Farsi, and he translates pretty crudely. And he's saying, damn America. That's what he's saying, quite obviously. Then I thought, have I ever thought, damn somebody? And I thought, well, to be honest, yeah, I have thought, damn those teenagers on occasion. <laughs> now, do I really want them to die and burn in hell for an eternity? <laughs> no, it's just after midnight, turn down the music, damn those teenagers, you know? <laughs> death to traffic, death to election fraud, death to the Shah, death to America, death to Khomeini. They've all, that's what they say, that's how they talk. And we Americans are... We insult ourselves by making a bumper stick out of it and freak out about it. We let ourselves do that. We know we're being stupid and naive and simple-minded, but we let ourselves do it because it makes it easier for us to, to do the things we do, I guess. When you travel, you have to deal with the complexity of the world in a beautiful way. And Iran's a great place to travel. It's a complicated place. It's a place with terrible baggage. We were talking about 9-11 baggage. They lost a couple hundred thousand people fighting a guy named Saddam Hussein who was funded by the United States when he invaded their country. They had carnage on their border with Iraq that was like Germany and France in World War I. Now maybe we don't believe that we really paid Saddam to invade. Doesn't really matter. They believe it and they've got 200,000 widows. I mean that's the baggage. That's who's putting Ahmadinejad in power is people like this woman who every week for 20 years has sat on the tomb of her son or her husband or her dad and cried and probably cursed America. It's a powerful scene to go to a cemetery 
And in every town in Iran, there's a vast martyr's cemetery. It's called a martyr's cemetery. Filled with people who they think were killed by America via Saddam Hussein. So that's complicated. And they don't just get over that that easy. You know, she's probably not a very sophisticated political mind. And she's had to live with all sorts of very clever propaganda to demonize you and me. What's the solution? I think the solution is to try to better understand them. To realize where are they coming from. They grew up with the Shah on the throne. When the Shah was on the throne for a whole generation, he was put there by throwing out a democratically elected prime minister. And he was thrown out in 53 because he nationalized their oil and he can't do that. There's no question about why we put the Shah on the throne. And when the Shah was on the throne for 30 years or whatever, they were bragging that the miniskirts are shorter in Tehran than they are in Paris. Now, I think that's cool. <laughs> but if you are a salt-of-the-earth Iranian mother, you're disgusted by this demon on the throne who America put there so they could get our oil. You know, they're not dumb. They can put all those, they can connect the dots there. I was on the street in Iran and this, just doing my work, a woman came across the street. She said, are, are you an American journalist? I said, yeah. She did this on my chest, you know, and she said, I want you to go home and tell the truth. We're strong, we're united, and we just don't want our little girls to be raised like Britney Spears. <laughs> First thing I thought is, we've got something in common here, you know? <laughs> She was worried that if we change their government, regime change, put in somebody that we can work with, you know, we can do that without giving it a second thought. American values will come in and her little girl will become a boy toy, a drug addict, and a crass materialist. Of course, she's a victim of propaganda, but it's not an unreasonable fear if you lived there and saw what was coming in from the West. You can't imagine. Iran's attitude to the West because of their 2,000 years of history with the West. I was there in their museum trying to film and I got to the National Museum which had all the treasures I thought for Persepolis and Xerxes and Cyrus and all that incredible stuff and it's nothing but a few broken vases and I was traumatized. I got a TV show to make. Where's your good stuff? I talked to the curator. This is, you call this a museum? He said if you want to see our treasures you got to go to Europe because all of our treasures are in Europe. Now an American might say, get over it, but you can't get over that. You know, your Liberty Bell is in Moscow. What are you going to do? <laughs> Go to Moscow and, and, and do your Yankee Doodle. You know, it just doesn't work. So it's a complicated thing and it's fun to get in there and, 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 and learn about it. And it occurred to me, why would a guy that seems so nutty as Ahmadinejad be in power? And because he's so bombastic, there's a good chance we're going to have a war with him. How can he be voted into power? Who supports him? Well, he's supported by a vast country, 70 million people, and a majority of them are not big city sophisticates. They're small town, less educated fundamentalists, motivated by exactly the same things their counterparts are here in the United States. They're good people motivated by fear and love. Good people motivated by fear and love. And they don't understand us and they're victimized by propaganda. We can go there and we can learn about it. Or we can be less easy to manipulate here. And if they say Iran assassinated the uh, ambassador by hiring some thug in Mexico to do it, you can kind of go, well, wait a minute, is it that simple? Remember what happened a couple months ago? We just embraced that. Oh, yeah, let's go to get them, you know. But it's always more complicated. Or it's, it, it may be more complicated and we owe it ourselves to get to know these people. It was so fun to go there. I, I would highly recommend it. Anybody can go there. We have an economic embargo on them, so you can't. You're not supposed to spend money there and stuff, but you can take a tour and you can, uh, you can go there on vacation. Easy, perfectly legal. In fact, the Lonely Planet Guidebook to Iran sells quite well, not among Americans, but everybody else who goes there. 